Welcome, my name is Steve Gow. I'm the Regional Agronomy Manager for the Eastern Region of Bex Highports. And with me today, I have some fellow agronomists from the Eastern Region, so we're gonna talk about the tar spot. So we're gonna start off with Travis. Introduce yourself, Travis. Travis Burnett, I would be the Northern Indiana agronomist, uh, with the exception of a few guys up there that Aaron will, uh, I'm sure, talk about. But basically north of Highway 70, state of Indiana. Yep, and I'm Aaron Brooker. I'm Michigan agronomist. I cover Michigan and a few counties in northwest Indiana. And I'm Mike Hannibal. I cover uh, northern Ohio as the agronomist, then also a few counties in northeast Indiana. All right, gentlemen, we're here today to talk about tar spot, right? It's the hot topic in the industry, especially in, in your areas. And we're seeing a lot of yield differences, variation, stock, but lots of stuff going on with tar spot, right? And but there's a lot of questions that come with it, and, and probably a lot of assumptions being made too about tar spot. So let's go into a little bit of the history of tar spot. So Mike, why don't you tell us a little kind of the, the basics of tar spot, where it came from, and, and where it's going? Yeah. So from where I'm at in northern Ohio, it feels like tar spot something brand new, but we've had it for several years. Um, started it was first found in uh, 2016 um, in Illinois, Wisconsin. Uh, we had found out there, and then slowly spread and, and really blew up the first time in 2018 uh, in western Michigan, West Central Michigan was uh, up there. And it's, it's slowly spread. Um, in 19, it was fairly widespread and got down into Ohio just a little bit um, across the, you know, northern Indiana. But then in 20, we didn't see a whole lot of it. Um, 2020 was a little bit drier year, and, and that was kind of our assumption was, well, in a drier year, we may not see as much. And, and it really, it didn't cause many problems. But then this year, 2021, it has just overtaken the, the northern Corn Belt, northeastern Corn Belt areas, um, and has, has spread spread pretty dramatically. So, so Mike, you kind of right, there's the history of it, right? If I'm out in the field looking at it, I'm getting a lot of assumptions of what it, what does tar spot look like out in the field right now? Yeah, so it, it looks just like the name. It spot looks like spots of tar. Is if you took a paintbrush and stuck it in a black a bucket of paint and just dabbed it all over the leaves. Um, so the way to identify it for sure is to to take a look at the leaves. And uh, just take your finger and try and rub, it, rub the spots off. Um, <clears throat> once the disease is, is fully established in the leaf, it'll show up on both the upper and lower sides of the leaves, and you cannot scratch uh, scratch those lesions off without damaging the leaf. So that's the easiest way to know for sure. Okay, great. So Travis, we're, we're kind of talking about what it is and how to identify it. So maybe give us a little bit of what's the life cycle of it? Right? When do I expect to see it? What kind of temperatures are going to make it grow? And then we're going to play a little bit of Mythbusters, right? Because we've got all these stories, and because it's so new, we're still learning, right? And, and, and how's it affecting? And everybody's got their own kind of story. So we'll kind of move into that. But first, start off with tell us about the life cycle of it and what kind of weather conditions do we need for tar spot? Yeah, so uh, prior to it uh, coming up here in the States with Corn Belt, uh, kind of originated in uh, Central America, okay? Um, and, and one of the things when we first saw it back in 2000, 16, 16, 17 time frames. When we first started digging in, trying to learn about this, uh, one of the first things that we, we thought we knew was that uh, we didn't think that we'd be able to overwinter in our residue, uh, which we said is proven wrong, right? And hence why we're here talking about today. Um, but typically, this disease likes uh, cool, moist conditions. That's typically what it thrives in. But we thought that our winters up here were harsh enough to actually kill that, that pathogen. And, we wouldn't have a, a recurring problem with residue and inoculum uh, with that overwear. Uh, so that's one of the things that we have um, kind of disproven, okay, that, that school of thought. Um, but really what's, what's interesting with tar spot and what makes it uh, maybe tougher to control with others is kind of how it disperses or spread, okay? Um, so like some other diseases, if, you know, if it does overwinter in the residue, you can get uh, uh, infection from the inoculum that's in your own soil. Okay, so there's things that we can do to manage diseases like that with managing residue and tillage and uh, you know, lots of different things there, crop rotation being another one. Uh, but what makes this disease so tough is um, that's not the only way in which this disease spreads. Um, so those spores can actually get airborne up on the wind currents. In fact, like what's your, your Tar, 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 tar spot has a steep dispersal gradient. Steep dispersal <laughs> gradient. So basically, that means for that. Yeah, it, 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 it actually um, explodes, for lack of a better word, up into the air. Okay, uh, somewhere up around 200 feet is how far they can travel without any outside influence. Okay, so you start adding wind and different things into that. Think of how far the, the spores can actually move. 
and it gets kind of along those wind currents and it gets spread across you know a big area real fast. Uh, and really, that's what makes tar spot so hard to challenge or so hard to manage, and it's been challenging for us to, to figure out the last few years. There's, it really doesn't matter what your rotation is, right? Uh, it doesn't really matter if you had a uh, tar spot last year or you have a, an oxalum in your soil, what's happening on a bigger scale? Okay, what do your neighbors have? Did, was it in their fields last year? How much corn on corn acre during your general area? There's lots of little patterns that we're picking up on. That's what makes this disease a little tougher to manage versus some others because of how aggressively it spread based off of um, how it can move with those wind, wind currents. The one slight silver lining to that aggressive spread, though, is it's easy to scout for. You don't have to hunt and find it and scout every acre of every field. When it hits a field, it's going to hit the whole field pretty evenly, and it's, it's very easy to find once, once it does show up. Correct. So, Aaron, when it does show up, what, what kind of time frame are you looking at before it starts to do damage? Yeah, so as far as when, it, when it's traditionally shown up, it, it's kind of very year to year and that's what's making it so hard for us to come up with with really good recommendations to control this disease year to year and so certain years we've seen it come in early uh, this year would be a great example of that uh, we saw it even sometimes pre-tassel this year uh, some of those early uh, lesions coming up in those like, lower parts of those plants early on uh, last year might have mentioned it, it came in quite late um, you know some cases it came in heavy late last year but, but it, it didn't have that early infecting period. That's one of the things we think is quite different this year. So um, we're, we're not sure exactly on that time frame year to year. And Travis mentioned those conditions that like those cool, moist type of conditions um, to infect, but but we're, we're just not sure. We can't predict the weather that well to know exactly when that's, when that's gonna occur year to year, so. The interesting thing with tar spot is, um, to kind of the Aaron's point there, it's from what we've seen, it's either a disaster or it's really no big deal at all. And just because you have the black spots show up on your on your leaf doesn't mean that it's going to be a, a disastrous yield impact. Um, it's it's about to Aaron's point, it's about the timing of when that infection occurs as to whether or not you've got the potential for disaster or whether it's just cosmetic and you can still have great yielding corn. And now, for my area in Northern Ohio this year, most of it's been a pretty minimal yield impact. Um, it, it looks ugly, but um, but next year that could be different. Yeah, and add on to what Mike said, as far as the yield impact, uh, that's one of the big things we see with this disease. Uh, if it comes in early, we can see a lot of grain mill impact and actually impact our corn yields. And so uh, that can be a major impact of this disease. But uh, a lot of what we've seen this year, we had that early infection period, kind of sat latent there for a while, and then we had that big explosion later in the season. A lot of the problems we're seeing this year is mostly with that stand loss. Um, we do have areas that had that actual yield loss, that grain fill disruption there, um, but we are seeing a lot of standability issues this year. And I think Travis can dive into more why yes. we're seeing that. So, so, so to not overcomplicate things, but to add to what both Mike and Aaron mentioned there, um, you know, and, and to reiterate what Mike said, the majority of the area that I cover, so think of the north central portion of the state. I can take you to every field and show you tar spot lesions. That's still a, a crop standing, right? So it's everywhere. But to Mike's point, it came in late enough that it really wasn't yield influencing, okay? Uh, for most of those situations. Now, the thing that we have found and, and kind of one of the keys around managing or, or kind of looking for tar spot or getting a better handle on how big of a yield penalty there's going to be with tar spot, uh, it, it really revolves around what other stressors are impacting that plant. Okay, so in situations, and this is what we saw some of the, the early years of tar spot where, where that plant is feeling good, right? It's not really wanting for anything from a nutritional standpoint, uh, especially when we have good conditions during the rain fill. Uh, tar spot seems to not really matter a whole lot. Again, just because you have some lesions on the plant, not that big of a deal. The problem we ran into this year is all of the other stressors that were kind of stacked on that plant during the rain fill. Uh, so things like, uh, one of the big things was we had a lot of nitrogen deficiency this year. Um, not because anybody did anything wrong with managing nitrogen, but it was the cards we were dealt with weather, right? We had pretty significant rains early on in the year during the, the vegetative stages when that plant was taking up a lot of nitrogen. Um, so we had a lot of nitrogen deficiency later in the year. Uh, that was one of the stresses that we've seen kind of widespread. Uh, another one, uh, had a lot of warm nighttime temperatures during the rain fill. Uh, had a lot of cloudy 
uh, kind of hazy days. I remember the wildfires and how hazy the, the, the sunny days were, you know, during during Greenville. That's not the, all these things are, are basically that triggers that plant into um, cannibalizing uh, resources from the stalk and the roots and the leaves, so the vegetative parts of that plant. So once that process starts, that's where we see tar spot come in and really. I think of it as a kind of an opportunistic type of disease. It kind of sits there latent, maybe, in the plant, doesn't do a whole lot, but when that plant's under stress for other reasons, the synergism of tar spot and those other stressors really take that plant down very fast. Okay, I mean, in some cases, less than three weeks, you know, we see plants go from green to brown, and that's all um, contributing to the sustainability issues that we're seeing widespread this year. That Eric mentioned, right? When, once once that first domino falls, that first stressor falls, and we start stacking all these things on top of each other, we're really aggressively trying to rob carbohydrates from that stalk to finish that grain or to put on viable seed on that grain or on that ear. And you know, we're left with a, a very uh, skeleton type like um, stalk and any sort of winds or other things. You know, we're going to have some issues with same building. We're, we're forced to deal with that this year. So what you're saying then is that because of all these additional stressors we've had through the 2021 growing season have made the tar spot issue worse than maybe it is? That's my belief. I guess our belief. We talk about this pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's been a major issue uh, initially for sure and in the northern and central Indiana. And definitely um, with, with that rainfall, I think we lost a lot of nitrogen earlier in the season. And so I think that's caused a lot of additional stress, just like Travis said. So in 2022, then, if I put extra nitrogen on and give it plenty of fertilizer, I won't have any tar spot issues? Well, I think, I think that just becomes difficult to predict again. I mean, it's, we, we can't see what the weather's going to do, so you can put on all the additional nitrogen you want. I mean, we can get we can get, we can get <laughs> inches of rain again, and that is going to be gone just like Another this. fun thing to, to talk about. So the other year where tar spot was really bad would have been 2018, right? So, Think back to that year. There's the reason tar spot was bad that year. There was actually another disease that came in earlier, in, in a big way, that started to compromise that plant's immune system more or less. Okay, and that was very least spot. That was a really, really big, very least spot year. So again, just like all the other stresses I mentioned from 2021, this last year, once that plant is is compromised, that's where the tar spot can be really devastating. So ultimately, then. You, you got to manage the crop to be as successful as you can now to just help keep the tar spot somewhat at bay, right? It's not, not perfect. The same thing can be said for any disease, right? Yes. I mean, it's not just tar spot, it's just that one seems to be a little more aggressive than some others that we're used to dealing with. Yeah, especially here in the northern territories. So. Okay. So before we kind of get into the plan for next year, we, we've seen this thing move a little bit through northern Indiana, right? We, I'm from southern Indiana. I get the opportunity to work all the way down in the Kentucky, Tennessee. We saw tar spot but everywhere, right? Obviously not yield robbing. Do we think it's going to be a nationwide issue? Do we think it's going to stay isolated? Where do we think it could go? And that's where, when you look at what we thought we knew about tar spot is, is somewhat changing. So it started off, Illinois kind of moved up into Wisconsin, Michigan, Northern Indiana, and then Northern Ohio. And we thought, well, that makes sense. It seems to like cooler, damper conditions. And so if you move further south, you have fewer, you know, your nights are warmer, you're going, you know, you don't have as cool damp conditions. But then this year, kind of turned that on its head. It's still still spread spread there. So, um, for for the guys that uh, that I work with uh, in you know Northern Ohio, Northeast Indiana, I've been saying, you know, I think this is gonna be something we've talked about. Great, we should bought you know, leaf blight every year. We're just gonna add tar spot to that list. You know, as far as for the more southern territories where it just got through this year, I think the jury's still out on that. We'll have to see how it behaves in the future. Very good. Well, I know in 2018 you saw some down south, then saw none again until this year. So it's interesting where it travels, why, and how true it Yeah, I think that, that's an interesting point, Steve, because even up north where we, we tend to think this disease is the bigger problem, I think that's a good point to make that 2018 was, was bad here. 2019, very, very limited pockets of tar spot. 2020 came in late, and now this year it's big again. What the pattern is, is that we're not, we're not necessarily seeing a pattern yet. So. Um, you know, as, as much as we want to be able to prepare for this disease and, and be able to, to control it the best we can, we, we also have to realize uh, just with any of our other diseases, it's likely to be pretty cyclical. 
um, going to affect pockets each year, potentially going to be widespread every, you know, on a given year, but um, it's definitely something to keep in mind with, with the patterns of when it's going to affect year to year. Okay. So let's start to switch a little bit. Let's think about 2022. Right? What am I doing today to make plans to help me with tar spot next year? Right. So the first thing I think about is seed ordering, right? We're seed company, about to order seed. So are there hybrid differences? Are there genetic differences? Are there some things I should consider? Or does it not matter? Hey, every hybrid is going to have the opportunity to get it and, and just order the best product for your acre. All Bex hybrids are eating a tar spot. Absolutely not the case, right? Um, there is some genetic differences, right? Um, and, and we see that. And, and it's one of the tools that we can use to um, to manage this disease, especially in those areas where we've been dealing with it for you know four or five years now, where there's a lot of corn on corn, where there's a lot of irrigated acres, where you have longer periods of that leaf wetness that and the, the environment where that thing really thrives. Those areas, it's definitely something we need a tool we can use, right, in those situations. Now, it's not the only tool, and that's the biggest thing we want to want to mention here. Um, you know, my area, like I said before, three quarters or probably more than eighty percent of it, tar spot really wasn't a limiting factor. Yet every week I'm getting phone calls around, hey, I, I need to know what tar spot ratings are in every one of these hybrids. That's the first thing some guys want to select around. Well, that's not the message we want to want to get out there, right? With tar spot, especially in those areas where it's, it's less likely to be a problem, because there's a lot of other factors we need to select around to get the right genetics and the right acre. And tar spot can be a, a piece of that, but it certainly shouldn't be the first uh, sort, okay, when you think about selecting a hybrid in the majority of the situations that we're, all three of us are selling it, right? Yeah, yeah, I think just to add on to that, for me, a couple of key things when we think about hybrids, uh, a lot of it goes back to what Travis was talking about with the different stressors that are playing those through and how that contributes to tar spot. We can actually look at these different hybrids and some of them, you know, they, they vary in their nitrogen use and when they need nitrogen and how much nitrogen they need and how they respond to that. So so plants this year, hybrids this year, that that didn't respond well to that, that reduced nitrogen, those nitrogen deficiencies, we're actually seeing those uh, compounded with tar spot fare a little bit worse this year. Um, just just the combination. So that I think we're definitely seeing some hybrid differences there. And so it's not just a tar spot uh, issue there. I think another thing that's important to point out is that um, so far we haven't been able to determine if the number of lesions correlates to the amount of yield we, we lose. So this year's been a perfect example of that. You can go out to pretty much any field right now, uh, in my territory for sure, you can see every plant covered in tar spot, but, but the yield differences are going to vary quite a bit between hybrids, between how they put different stressors in the field and then how the tar spot compounded on top of that. So you're telling me that if we saw a hybrid 58-58, right? It was, uh, or sorry, 58-28, that would get gray leaf spot, right? We get a lot of gray leaf spot, so a lot of lesions, but never affected yield. Do you think we'll see that with tar spot? We'll have a hybrid that almost looks like it's covered in it, but it didn't hurt the yield. Potentially, you know, we we yeah we we take gradients on all the hybrids, and, and we see uh, big uh, differences between different hybrids, but. You know, my recommendation is still pick the right hybrid that fits the big picture of what the particular field you're going to place it on is. Tar spot's one piece of that, but it's just one piece of the picture. And then manage accordingly. Use the ratings to guide your scouting and, and um, fungicide treatment efforts as opposed to guiding which hybrids you pick. So, all right, so I'm moving through 2022. I'm, I'm picking the best hybrid for my acre, right, in terms of what, what my management style is. So what's going to be my next steps for making recommendations there? Yeah, so in my opinion, I think, um, you know, we want, to, we want to have a silver bullet. We want to take care of this disease, knock it out. Um, but I think it just goes back to those general uh, pest management practices. So I think the first thing for me is just scouting. Um, as simple as that sounds, uh, we need to be out in those fields. And right around tassel time is about what we're recommending right now, getting out there. Um, Everybody's favorite time to be in a cornfield, that pop pollen's flying, but, but that's when we tend to see this disease have, it, have its earliest impact um, and start to get into fields uh, in certain years. So right around tassel, uh, starting in those fields, scout weekly. Um, right now, one of the things we're not sure about is uh, if, if tar spot gets into that plant, and before we 
we'll see those lesions, what, what the impact of that, that early infection prior to lesions is. So, so unfortunately, we don't have you know, a good, good answer for that. We can't tell when the plant's there or that disease is there until we start seeing those lesions. So I think to Mike's point, especially on those uh, more susceptible hybrids, um, if it's a hybrid that's gone through a lot of stress, uh, and then we start seeing that seeing that uh, tar spot show up in that field. That's that's when we're going to want to implement that plan moving forward. Um, and we we sometimes talk about a, you know the, the football analogy here. And we talk about this with with nitrogen timing on too. But but you think about a football game. So um, if we start at the beginning of the football game and we have you know our, our plan going into that game and if we try to make all of our decisions based on that same plan uh, throughout the rest of the game, we may win by a lot, we may lose by a lot, but we don't know, but we're, we're taking the same path throughout the, the whole time. Well, what if we get down by 20 and uh, halftime comes around and we have the opportunity to adjust that plan? So um, it comes back to the, the idea that, you know, we get to that halftime point. So halftime here is going to be right around that pollination time. So look back at that, that early part of the season, like Travis was getting to, with, with the, the nitrogen loss, with any other stresses that may have happened to that plant, and take that into account when you make that plan going forward uh, and how we're gonna manage manage this disease. Okay, so I'm out there, I'm scouting, I find some lesions. So what, what, what I do, call the airplane, tell them to start spraying, what, what's my plan now? Well, the first thing you gotta know is what, what, what's the day that you're finding it and what growth stages you're, you're recording at that point. Um, from what, what we've seen is if you are finding those lesions prior to the dose stage, um, so dose when you start to accumulate some dry matter in the kernel, or if you're not sure about the dose stage, uh, dent is much easier to determine. If you're at the dent stage and you're just not seeing lesions, you're pretty well home free at that point. The corn is far enough along, it's not going to be that big a deal. If it's much prior to that, that uh, dose stage or dent stage, um, then you probably want to be making some phone calls and getting some applications lined up to get a fungicide on as, as soon as possible. The other thing that's going to influence that, Steve, is the environment. We kind of hinted to that earlier, but if you're in a, in a corn on corn environment under water where you're irrigating a lot, maybe it's, maybe it's dry, right? You know, in water for the last couple of weeks pretty aggressively, I'm, I'm more apt to pull the trigger there earlier on, okay, in that whole process, simply because of the environment being conducive for that disease to be more of a problem. So there's lots of different things weaving in here, but then, unfortunately, that's how we're going to have to manage this disease going yeah. forward. Yeah, and I think um, we're we're all you know alluding to this, but but we talk a lot about fungicides, and so um, you know we talk we talk a lot about fertilizers right now. We're talking a lot about herbicide and availability right now. Um, we don't know what what fungicide is going to look like exactly next year, but but the best thing I think right now is to make that plan, and I think you should plan to be able to spray fungicide when you need to um, have that fungicide ready to go. Um, there could be scenarios like Mike said where we really don't think we, we need to make that application, but we don't want to get into a situation where we, we can't have access to that to that treatment when we need it. And coming back to the point we made earlier about the differences among hybrids is you know budget that into your plan and work with your your Bex dealer, your Bex dealer advisor, or, or us as your agronomist and, and figure out which hybrids are going to be more likely to need a fungicide budget into the plan as opposed to those that are going to be less likely. So just go by any old fungicide, but you know, it, there's been a lot of research on that, right? But, but we need a lot more work on that. So what, what do I do? A single mode of action, multiple, what do I look at? What do I look for? So the universities, uh, particularly Purdue and Michigan State, um, have been putting together some pretty good efficacy trials of fungicide on our spot, and we anticipate hopefully those results will be coming out here fairly soon. Uh, so that's something to look at, but then you can also look at our PFR proven uh, fungicide list. And, and the one thing in common with all those is they have multiple modes of action. And from what we found, uh, that holds true with tar spot, just like it does the other diseases that we've dealt with for years, is those, those products that, that have two or three different ways of attacking that disease uh, are going to be the best, best bet in this situation. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as we talk about this disease and the, the annual patterns that we've seen, and so this year we've had the most extensive infection that we've seen so far, um, definitely some of the most severe infections. So I think as we, as Mike talked about the university data, that's going to be really important this year. I think they're going to have some really good data this year uh, to share with us. So stay tuned for some of that. Uh, we'll share it with you uh, with, with 
Perkins University mycologist and extension specialist. Uh, they're going to give us a lot of good information on which fungicides uh, they're, they're even looking at a lot of timings of when to spray. Uh, they, they've got a lot of research coming out. I think this is going to be a good year to have good data. All right, so in the story of tar spot, what, what have we missed, right? We've talked about the cycle, we've talked about conditions, we've talked about recommendations. Anything, any last minute things you want to throw out there to, to everybody to keep in mind? I'd say the biggest thing is just uh, as you're evaluating this year, um, you know, just to reiterate, just because the tar spot is the most visible and the new thing, new disease in the block, doesn't mean that that's the cause of any challenges we have out in the field. So um, evaluating and understanding, looking past that to, to learn from this year what we can. But then just making sure that we're prepared next year to have a plan that if tar spot becomes a problem, we're ready for it. Um, does it mean it'll, it's going to be a disaster, but we just want to be, be prepared for this. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and educating us on tar spot today. And like they said, if you've got questions, reach out to your BEX representative, your dealer, your seed advisor, the agronomy team. We would love to help you out. We're going to be gathering a lot of data. We're working on the PFR book. It'll be coming out shortly, so you'll be able to learn what we talked about with the PFR proven fungicide. So check that out. And thank you for listening.